have it ready, find Psalm 30. Psalm 30 this morning as we're walking through the Psalms together and uh, this summer in the Psalms. And uh, last week we looked at, at Psalm 29. Uh, and thank you again, uh, Jeff Nash, our deacon chair, for uh, preaching and sharing God's word from Psalm 29. Psalm 29 last week was all about pure praise. Uh, it was a praise party. And praise parties are good for us because it reminds us of the greatness of who God is and what he means to us. Praise parties can, can recenter us to focus on the character and the nature and the activity of, of God in our lives. And, and our lives ought to be consumed with praise towards God, even when our circumstances change, even when difficulty comes our way. Now, now, we certainly need more praise parties than we do pity parties, and I've confessed before that I'm unfortunately good and skilled at, at personally throwing pity parties in many instances where I should be throwing praise parties, but I, but I believe that God uses the Psalms. He uses the Psalms over and over and over again to remind us to be thankful, to remind us to be grateful, uh, and as, as we read the Psalms and study the Psalms, they're all... Many of them are so similar, and as you're trying to preach through them and, and, and preach them uh, in that unique yet effective ways, you're like, a lot of this feels the same, like the same, same type praise and the same themes and the same concepts, and uh, yet they are unique to each situation and each circumstance, but I do believe that, that there's a reason and a purpose that over and over and over again in the Psalms we see praise and we see thanksgiving and we see gratitude and, and life was tough and I was in a difficult situation and God helped me and God rescued me and I, I praised him and I celebrated him. And God uses the Psalms over and over and over and over and over again to remind us to be thankful. They prompt us to praise like parents who are constantly saying over and over and over again, turn off the lights, shut the door, put your plate in the sink. Stop picking on your brother, and on and on and on, those things that we as parents feel like broken records saying over and over and over again in our lives. God is regularly reminding us over and over and over again to say thank you to him, to give praise to him. In today's passage, we see significant praise from David towards God after he's experienced some type of dramatic life event, after intense difficulty, God delivered David, and David testifies to God's goodness and God's faithfulness. And when we experience great difficulty in our lives, and God delivers us, God rescues us, God lifts us up, we too ought to be praising his name. So let's look at Psalm 30 together, written by David. It says, I will exalt you, Lord, because you've lifted me up and have not allowed my enemies to triumph over me. Lord, my God, I cried to you for help, and you healed me. Lord, you brought me up from Sheol. You spared me from among those going down to the pit. Sing to the Lord, you his faithful ones, and praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there's joy in the morning. When I was secure, I said, I will never be shaken. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a strong mountain. When you hid your face, I was terrified. Lord, I called to you. I sought favor from my Lord. What gain is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it, will it proclaim your truth? Lord, listen and be gracious to me, Lord. Be my helper. You turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I'll praise you forever. A testimony uh, of deliverance. It feels as though David's been delivered from death's door. Whatever happened, David is, is now heaping praise upon God for, 
lifting him up, like, like drawing water from a well, God lifted David up and he rescued him. In 1987, the world was introduced to the story of Jessica McClure. Now, many of you may not recognize that name, but those of you uh, who are old enough to remember, unfortunately, probably anybody under the age of 40 doesn't remember. Jessica McClure is better known as Baby Jessica. 18-month-old baby Jessica fell into a well in Midland, Texas. The opening and width of that well was only eight inches wide. And she was stuck in there for 58 hours. And my family, mom and dad are here today, I'm sure they remember well, along with the entire nation, were glued to the television Day and night as rescuers worked frantically around the clock trying to find the way to lift her from safety. Many conventional methods wouldn't work for it would cause uh, the, the well to, to collapse and, and her, her life would be even in more danger. And it was a delicate, long, intricate process. But after 58 hours, they miraculously were able to, to rescue her, to lift her up from the well. And everyone rejoices. And there's, there's few things that, that are randomly still etched in my mind. But I can, I can see some of that grainy video of, of the workers, uh, weary and, and dirty. And the, and, the, and the people in the community rejoicing. And people, uh, in some instances, all over the world celebrating that baby Jessica had been rescued. Feels like David's circumstance was somewhat similar. It could have been a severe illness or some type of near death experience. We're, we're not exactly sure, but whatever happened was significant. And David knew and understood the significance of it because when he was rescued, he rejoiced. You see, in this psalm, we see that, that David's momentary grief turns into eternal praise. And eternal gladness. And he's thankful in ways he wasn't before the experience. He's looking back in the perspective of what happened and what went on. And in the moment it was grief. But now that he's on the other side of it and he's seen the, the hand and the work and the grace of God in his life. He's filled with gladness. You see the right perspective can change us. For the better, a new perspective and seeing the hand of God in, in your life can give you greater gratitude, can give you the ability to see the nature of God more clearly, the activity of God more specifically in your life. And God is kind to us, even in our grief, even in our difficulties. And he wants to use our experiences to, to help us better see who he is and how much he really loves us. I heard a pastor say recently that, that God often humbles us with momentary grief so that we might be exalted with eternal gladness. This is David's story. This is the heart of Psalm 30. David praises God for lifting him up, for protecting him from his enemies, for healing him as he cried for help and, and sparing his life. And then David goes on to call on others to join in the praise. As Brock read this morning, our, our call to worship, he encourages public praise of God as he opens with saying, God, God, you rescued me and I love you and I'm thankful. In verse 4, he says, sing to the Lord, you faithful ones, and praise his holy name. It goes from, a, from an individual praise to a corporate praise. Not only am I praising God for who he is and what he's done, but, but, but we need to praise the Lord for what he's done. Sing to the Lord, you his faithful ones. Praise his holy name. I feel like David's saying, come on, church. Let, let, let's praise God together. Because we've all been lifted up. We've all been helped. We've all been rescued. We, we've all been delivered by God at some point and in some way. And let's thank him and let's celebrate him together. He goes on in verse 5, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor a lifetime. Weeping may stay overnight, but there's joy in the morning. Sorrow may last for the night, but there's joy 
in the morning. His anger is temporary, but his favor is eternal. Weeping and pain and sorrow and and grief and trouble and, and heartache may last for the night, but there's joy coming in the morning. There's hope on the other side of your grief. There's joy coming that's going to overshadow your pain. This is our mantra. This is our battle cry. This is Jesus. Our hope is in God. Our faith is in Jesus. We can be rest assured that there's joy on the other side of our sorrow for those whose faith is in Jesus. There's gladness on the other side of our grief. There's victory on the other side of our battles because God's final word is always deliverance for those whose faith is in him. Our God is a God who delivers. Our God is a God who delivers. Now, he's not always going to hold back the difficulty and the hardship and the suffering from our life. God doesn't always protect us from our pain. He's not always going to spare us from our suffering. But what God will do is allow all of these experiences of of trouble and and difficulty and, and suffering and pain to humble us. And draw us to a deeper level of dependence upon him. God's not always going to protect you from your hardship. God's not always going to protect you from your difficulty. But he will ultimately deliver you when your faith is in him. And and David's not proclaiming. God's not promising that that, that true and full deliverance from the, the, the pain of this temporary life will ever go away, that some of the grief that we have in this life will ever completely go away. But he promises us an eternity through Jesus Christ. And that someday, at some point, it's going to be morning. And the sorrow is going to be gone and the joy is going to be present. That the grief is going to fade and that the gladness is going to rise up in us. Parents, grandparents, we can only do so much to protect our children, to protect our grandchildren. It's a hard reality. We can't protect them from everything. We can try. We can we, we can do what we can and, and protect them where we can. And, 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 and kids and grandkids, listen up. We're doing it because we love you. We're trying to protect you because we love you. And many of us have been there. And many of us see from a different perspective than maybe what you see from. But but it's a hard reality as a parent and and as a grandparent that that we can't protect them from everything. In, In fact, unfortunately, the reality is often we can protect them from very little in this life. But what we can do is we can focus on preparing them as much as we are trying to protect them. Prepare them for the difficult. Prepare them for the unexpected. Prepare them for the uncertain times in life by helping them develop a healthy and lasting perspective of who God is, no matter the circumstances. Prepare them to expect the unexpected. Protect them where you can protect them. But prepare them and prepare yourself to maintain a proper perspective of God no matter what the circumstances are in your life. Lead your children and grandchildren to put their faith in Jesus Christ so that they can have the promise that David proclaims here in Psalm 30. Verse 5, that that grief is temporary but gladness is eternal when our faith is rooted in Jesus. Take verse 5 to heart, Uh, underline it, highlight it, unless it's on your iPad or your device, because that'll probably mess it up. But but memorize it, write it down, circle it, write it on a card. Sorrow may last for the night, grief may stay overnight, but what joy is coming in the morning? Remember this promise, Let let it comfort you, let it compel you, no matter what human suffering we face, when our human suffering ends, eternity and the glorious presence and perfect presence of Jesus begins. David suffered 
David prayed, and God delivered, and David rejoiced. See the pattern there? The pattern ought to be true in our lives, unfortunately. We're going to suffer, and we should pray. And eventually, in God's way, in God's time, according to God's purpose, God will deliver, and we can rejoice. But what's striking is we notice that in, in, in these verses, David mentions that, that God's anger lasts only a moment. This is significant to the situation here. And the rest of what we see in Psalm 30, in verses 6 and following, somewhat expounds on David's circumstances. David said, when I was secure, I said, I'll never be shaken. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a, a strong mountain. When things were good and I was secure and when I was confident, everything was great. Lord, when you showed your favor, you made me stand like a, a strong mountain. When I, when I could feel your presence and when I could, could experience your power in my life and I could, I could clearly, visibly see and understand that, that, that you were there and that you were working. I was able to stand like a strong mountain when you hid your face. I was terrified. Somehow, someway, David lost his way. He lost his focus. He lost his sense of dependence upon God. He developed some false sense of security. His security was in his circumstances. His security was in the blessings that he was receiving and experiencing at this time in his life. And, and, and whatever David did, and we don't know exactly, he began to rely on himself. He began to rely on his accomplishments rather than the presence of God in his life. He felt somewhat invincible, it seemed. And he was certain that he couldn't be shaken and, and nothing could rattle him, nothing could get to him, nothing could affect him. But then his circumstances changed. His self-confidence turned to terror and fear. And David realized how hopeless he really was without the awareness of the presence of God in his life. Psalm 71, verses 20 and 21 says, You caused me to experience Many troubles and misfortunes, but you will revive me again. You will bring me up again. Even from the depths of the earth, you will increase my honor and comfort me once again. See, this is not the only instance, Psalm 30, Psalm, Psalm 71, that, that it seems as though God withdrew some of his protective power from David. He didn't protect David from everything. Because he wanted to teach David that he's vulnerable. He wanted to teach David that on his own, he's not strong enough. And it led him to, to utter dismay, to, to terror, to fear. David feels this sense of abandonment from God. Though we know by faith God never abandons us, he never leaves us and never forsakes us. But there's this perception and this feeling and this lack of assurance of the presence and, and the power of God in his life. And, and David expresses very concern back in Psalm 27 that we saw a few weeks ago, Psalm 27, 9. David says, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not leave me or abandon me, God of my salvation. See, in David's situation here in Psalm 30, he became secure in his self-power. And he was doomed when God allowed his circumstances to fall apart. You see, our sin, our selfishness, our dependence and confidence in our self above our confidence in God leaves God angry. And if he chooses to withdraw his power and not provide the level of protection that we want and expect of him in every single circumstance. We're left feeling rejected, isolated, vulnerable, 
helpless. Be careful. Be careful finding your security in your circumstances. Be careful looking for security in your feelings. Be careful looking for security from any other source than from God alone. Ground your hope and your confidence in God alone. God allows seasons of grief in our lives, hoping that we'll walk through them faithfully and ultimately that we'll see God's purpose in them. And these seasons of grief, suffering, difficulty, will shape and define our relationship with Christ and our faith in Christ. In these times, we can often find ourselves questioning God's love and God's affection for us. Why would he, if he really cared and he was really loving and if he's the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, all-sufficient God that he is, why would he allow this to happen? We can often question God's love and affection for us. Or we can remain confident that God's always working for our good. Life can change on us in an instant. One decision, one diagnosis, one catastrophe. God often allows difficulty and trouble to humble us and recenter our dependence on Him. And, and, and hear this today. Sometimes circumstances in our lives are just that, they're circumstances. At other times, circumstances are consequences. Circumstances are the result of our decisions. And sometimes it's really hard to discern which is which. And I think we would do well to, to, to not ignore the fact that we may be sinning and God may be angry with us. And we may need to, to repent and confess and, and seek to make some things right in our life. That, that should be a constant state of where we are. But, but I find myself struggling oftentimes. Like, hey, is this circumstance, is this situation, is this difficulty, is this grief and this struggling? Did, did I bring this on myself? Is there something I did or something I didn't do? And is God punishing me? Is God teaching me? And, and that sends me down this unhealthy road. Focusing on the circumstances, focusing on myself when I really should be focusing on him. So sometimes the circumstances in your life are just circumstances. They're going to come and they're going to go. Sometimes they're going to be good. Sometimes they're going to be bad. Sometimes you're going to understand them. You're not going to understand them. But sometimes our circumstances are consequences. And it seems as though uh, God has, has withdrawn some of his protective power from David. And David's suffering from the anger of God temporarily and allowing him to be vulnerable. Allowing him to experience suffering and grief in his life. And sometimes we've brought this mess we're in upon ourselves. But at other times, and many times, it probably has no direct connection to our decisions. Try to be careful not to chase that, that, you know, that, that deep theological uh, you know, rabbit trail, per se. But let me say what matters most is our perspective of God during and after these circumstances. Often looking back on our circumstances, as David is doing here in Psalm 30. We can give thanks for the good and the bad as we realize that God is the one who is consistent through them all. And that our reactions and our feelings and our responses are different depending on whether or not we sense God's presence. Whether or not we, we assume his absence. And seeing God at work in the midst of trouble makes all the difference in the world. And David describes it well at the end of the psalm. 11 and 12, you turned my lament into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness so that I can sing to you and not be silent. Lord, my God, I'll praise you forever. God wants to remove your sackcloth and replace it with joy. He wants to turn your grief into gladness. He wants to lift you up where you've been knocked down. David is remembering with joy 
the deliverance of, of God in his life, and he finds himself now on the other side of suffering, and he's gained a new perspective. He's saying, God, you took off my sackcloth and you clothed me with joy. Sackcloth, in essence, is wearing your grief. In biblical times, when people were, were grieving, a physical representation of their grief would be sackcloth. They would take off their regular clothes and they would literally put on sackcloth. Because sackcloth symbolized and represented their grief. And a lot of us are walking around right now with sackcloth on. And we wear our sackcloth in many different ways. When we experience grief and we hurt and pain and loss. Sometimes we wear our grief with isolation. We, we, we push people away. We want to be alone. We lack motivation. Uh, we sometimes, in wearing our sackcloth, can experience physical weakness and illness. A loss of purpose. This overwhelming sense of emptiness in our grief. Anger. Just this like totally apathetic feeling towards life at, at, at times where you know, we don't want to shower, we don't want to put makeup on, we don't want to wear real clothes. We, we have no appetite. We're short-tempered, we're, we're angry. We're distant, we're numb, we're, we're scared. We wear our grief and we, we wear our sackcloth in, in so many different ways in our lives. And, and God wants to remove our sackcloth so that we can put on gratitude. He wants to deliver you. He wants to lift you up. He wants you to experience joy on the other side of your sorrow. Don't lose sight of the powerful presence and purpose of God in all things, at all times, in all circumstances. David's story is a story of deliverance. David's story is a story of rescue, and yours can be too when your faith is in Jesus. Look back on your life. See the reality of God's presence then and see the reality of God's presence now. Put your hope and confidence in, in God alone. Take time to reflect and remember what Jesus has done for you. Philippians 2, Paul writes so powerfully of Jesus. I think about David being humbled and beat down and then at the right time God lifting him up and exalting him with gladness and removing his humiliation and removing his grief and replacing it with joy and with gladness and with hope and with victory. And for me, Psalm 30 shouts of Jesus Christ. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he came as a man, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him a name that's above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus endured the punishment and the shame that you and I deserve because of our sin. He was thrown down in humiliation. God didn't protect him from the wrath of sin and the punishment of death for mankind, but allowed Jesus to endure it for our sake. He was thrown down in humiliation for ourselves. And what did God do? God lifted him up out of the grave. God exalted him with joy. Jesus was humbled. So that he might be exalted. So church, hold fast today. Keep your eyes on Jesus 
today. And eventually, someday, there's joy that's coming in the morning for those whose faith is in Jesus. Sorrow may stay overnight, but joy comes in the morning. Sing, as David says, and don't be silent. Praise the name of the Lord forever. And you can go from grief to gladness. Will you pray with me? Father, grief and suffering and loss and pain and heartache are so extremely difficult, we often don't understand it. And many times we never get over it, we just find a way by your grace to get through it. And Lord, we know that in, in, in this human life and how we're created, that, that, that grief comes in many different ways and uh, denial and, and bargaining and, and anger and, and so many other aspects of grief that are, that are a reality for so many of us and our suffering and our hurt, uh, and our humiliation, our, our loss, our pain. Sometimes it's circumstances that we can't control and sometimes maybe it's, it's because of some choices that we've made in our life. But through all of that, God, help us to remember and give praise that you made a choice to send Jesus for us. That because of Jesus and the example of his life and his death and his resurrection, that we can hold fast to your promise. That even though our sorrow may stay overnight, that joy comes in the morning. God, give us that hope today. Infuse us with that hope today. Take your people from grief to gladness. Help them to take off their sackcloth so you can put on joy and gratitude and praise and thankfulness for who you are and for the way that you're working in and through every circumstance of our lives. And may we put our faith in you today. God, empower those who don't know you to surrender their life to you today. God, strengthen and equip those who know you to deepen their relationship with you and be more committed in the way that they follow you. May your word re not, not return void, but to empower us and to equip us and to change us today for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now stand together. We're going to sing and worship together as we sing about Jesus and what he's done for us, and we thank him for the blood that he sacrificed for us. And as we sing, if you want to pray, we'll be here to receive you. You have a decision to make. We want to celebrate that with you.